these weird diode failures where something in some row that's connected to the switch that's actually causing the problem is the one that's, the one that's out. I wanted to design or to use direct connected switches. So I developed a little board. It's, it's about a two by three inch board that reads in 16 individual switches. It also sits on the serial chain. So if you want 16 switches, you need one board. If you want 32 switches, you use two boards, 48, three boards. This machine has four of those boards in it as well. Okay, so now we have a full control system. We have the P rod, we have driver boards, we have switch boards. We're good to go on the hardware side. Now we need some software. So we developed, we being me and a guy named Adam Preble, who's just a software guy who got in touch with me when he learned about the project and he wanted to help out. So he and I developed this framework, software framework. It's a pinball OS. It's written in Python, a high level language. So people who want to use these, these boards, the PROC and such, to build their own custom machines, they don't need to learn assembly language or C. They can, they can write high level code and develop their own. It's open source. It's free to download. It's free to, free to copy, modify, use. You can, you can build a biz, pinball business yourself. You can sell a thousand machines, use our framework. It's, it's free to use. It's open source. You're welcome to do that. Okay, so all of that was done in preparation for this. We called the P-Cubed. It was originally for P-Rock Pinball Platform. And it really is a pinball platform. This is not a machine that you're used to. And we don't want it to be. We're trying to sell a machine that you can buy one machine and you can play any number of games on it. The, uh, the value proposition we're trying to create is totally different from what's out there. We don't want you to go buy 10 different machines, cycle through your house, get bored of one, sell it, go buy another one. You're spending, what, two, three, four, up to six, seven, eight grand on all these machines. Where you could theoretically, if we do this right, you could buy one machine and it can represent tons of different playing styles, different modes, different games, different, different features. And I'll, and I'll walk you through the game and show you why we believe we've created a, a platform that you can do that with. Okay, so the first one, obviously there's a big LCD in the middle of the play field. And the one way we can use that is to create dynamic hardware. There are a couple other machines that are starting to come out that are doing the same thing, using little 9 by 9 or 13 inch monitors. It's cool because you can make the play field look like however you want it to look. You can write software to change the, uh, the look, the feel, the background. You can, you, can have things, you can have things animated on your screen. You can do things you can't do with a piece of wood and some artwork. And the other way this platform is going to be dynamic so that we can create multiple interesting games is the entire upper play field. And you can't see this at all on the screen, unfortunately, but again, you can come up afterwards and look at it. And by the way, we'll have this machine over in the game room after the seminar. We'll have it there all weekend. So come over, play it, try it out, see how you like it. Talk to me about it. Tell me what you like, what you don't like, give me your opinion. But the entire upper play field is a module or will be. This one isn't, but when we actually go build on this entire upper play field, we'll be able to pull it out. The four screws, essentially, they do a couple more. Pull it out, disconnect wiring harnesses, take another module, stick it in. The game, the system will recognize the module and enable the softwares, the software applications that are tied to that module. And the plan is to ship this machine with one module at first, multiple game apps and then every six months or every year after that release a new module with with new game apps and continue to support the old ones. <clears throat> Some games will work with any module, other games will be tied specifically to modules. Um, hopefully we can sign up some of the bigger name designers to design some some modules for us but right now we're going to ship this one first. Okay this is a pinball machine that you're used to. It's a piece of wood. So it's not quite a pinball machine that you're used to. Now it is. It's got white flippers on it. If you don't like white flippers, you can change the color of your flippers. You don't have to pull them out. Unscrew the big bolt, put new flippers in, and change the colors. It's still not quite a pinball machine that you're used to, though, because... Well, now it is. Right? It's got slingshots. It's got slingshot plastics. And unfortunately, the camera's not really picking up the artwork on them. There's a, there's a logo over here and here. They're much more visible when you're standing in front of the machine. 
But um, okay, it's still not really a pinball machine that you used to, but now it is. We got inserts, right? Any inserts we want. It's a little bit out of focus, but you get the idea. <clears throat> we can we can make any inserts we want. We can change the way they look. We can switch them around. We can, for example. Switch light lock to opposite sides. I mean, we can obviously it's dynamic. It's an LCD. We can change the graphics. We can make them go wherever we want them to. We can make them look however we want them to. We can make them blink, just like you're used to insert lamps blinking. But I guess it's still not really a pinball machine like you're used to, because it doesn't have any artwork in the play field. So guys, what do you like to look at when you're playing pinball? Girls. Girls. <laughs> Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Now's probably a good time to talk about pre-orders. Um, <laughs> so the guys are all smiling. The, the few ladies in the room are shaking their heads. But we got you covered, too. What's it all about? Maybe there's guys, there's girls, there are people like to look at cars, people like to look at spaceships. We got the kids covered. But the point is that we can make it look however we want it to look. And they're silly examples and they're, they're static pictures, but, but, I mean, yeah, you get the idea. So, in addition to interactive artwork, well, I, just blew the, I just blew the punchline. In addition to artwork, we have a new technology that lets the ball interact with that artwork. So we have the ability to track the ball as it's moving around the play field. And if you think about what you can do with that, well, you probably will think about what you can do with that in the next few minutes or next couple days, and you can really do anything. You can have monsters that you blow up with the ball. You can have things jumping in and out of the way of the ball. You can have, you can have virtual rollover switches that when the ball hits them or, or rolls over them, they change colors or indicate that you hit a shot or something. You can have things like propellers or something that interact with the ball as, you, as the ball rolls around the screen. And so real quickly to demonstrate all of this stuff in action, we have a couple of little demo applications that, uh, that I want to show off. Actually, can I have a volunteer to come up and play this? Yeah, please. What's your name? Dylan. Dylan? How you doing? All right, so you're going to be playing this barnyard demo. And all that's going to really, it's, it's, it's kind of tuned for kids. We actually took this machine to the Texas show back in March. And, and the kids started playing it. It's a little silly game, but they played it and played it. And we had to, usually we have a line wait behind and we had, to, we had to kick them off the machine and let people play. What's going to happen is you're going to have animals running across the screen and you're just going to shoot them with the ball. If you hit any other place on shot, it will send out a new, a new animal.
If you hit the saucer that flies across the screen when the ball starts, it'll light mode for you. And then the center will be is to collect that mode. So now the way you light mode is by hitting both captain balls. Yeah, if you hit them, if you hit them full, it will. space kind of gives us this, this, this nice canvas where we can create worlds that represent specific things. We can have a medieval madness world or an Adam's family world. I mean, we, can, we can create a world that is anything we want to make it. So it kind of gives us a good backdrop that we can go fill in different game apps on top of that. So again, dynamic artwork, module shot layout. Let's talk about the cabinet. Because it's a game platform, it's really like a, I don't know, it's like a Nintendo Wii or a PlayStation or, or something. That, I mean, that's kind of the goal. So what do you do with a cabinet when you're, when you're developing a game that you can theme however you want? You can have multiple game apps. You can't just come up and s put side art on there that, that's, that relates to a specific game. Well, you can, but then when you're playing the other games, I guess it's the same problem with a main cabinet or something where when you have this big cabinet. What do you do with the artwork? So, one thing I wanted to do was come out with a cabinet that would match people's home decor. If I were buying a machine, I would want it to match my pool table or match, match some of the furniture I have in my game room. Um, but I understand that other people aren't into that stuff. So what, what our plan is, is we're kind of going with the Dell or the Apple website model. Come onto the website, pick the platform. Right now we only have the one. Pick your cabinet style, pick your cabinet coloring, potentially pick your cabinet side art if we have two or three different versions of side art. The other thing we'll probably do is make it so that you can apply your own art, whether they're decals that you apply yourself or whether they're just, um, whether we have a, a box that you can open up, stick some side art and close it. But the idea is to make it as customizable as we possibly can because we know people, I mean a lot of you are probably looking at it and saying this is too plain, this is, this is this isn't what I'm used to with the pinball machine to do. It won't go with the other machines. And sure, that's true for the side art. It's also true for the back box. Um, I personally like it without the back box. When I stick this in my, in my, well, we have it in my office at home, and I have an open archway to my living room, and I love the fact that I can stick this machine in my room, and it doesn't just take up the whole room. It's physically the same footprint. But something about not having a back box makes it feel a lot smaller. You can see right over it. When we were at the Texas show, we would stand behind it and watch people. And it's funny because you can see the ball when it's going right down the center drain. And people don't realize it's coming. But you know it's about, it's about the drain of the flippers. So definitely come by later. Tell me your feedback on the cabinet, on the back box. I'm going with the, with the option model. I, I want people to have the option of doing whatever they want. I'd like to give people the option of designing third-party back boxes, right? A, a lot of people like to customize their machines. A lot, of, a lot of home business owners like to build new things for the pinball community. 
Maybe it's better if I don't build a back box. Let's, let's let someone who likes working on back boxes and doing their own art, let's let them design some back boxes. The other idea is having a monitor up here too. We have the monitor in the play field, but that's good for it's good for the home, the home environment. It's not so good for the arcade environment. So maybe we put a monitor connection up the back and let people connect the monitor. Maybe we add a framework for putting slideshows up there, running animations, or or heck, even a, a framework for pulling in advertisements. Or I mean, when you talk about that kind of stuff, there's a, there's a ton of things you can do. I'm more concentrating right now on the machine and stuff. Right? We want to come out with a platform. We've We've brought a machine here, we're showing you it works. We realize we don't quite have the reputation that a John Pop Duke does or a Jersey Jack does, where you're all just gonna go throw down 7, 10, 17K on a machine without even knowing what the beam is or without seeing a, a working prototype. We know we're not that, we're not that, we're not in that position. So this is our second prototype. We took the first one to Texas. This one's this one's different. For those of you who saw it in Texas, this one has a bigger monitor. The one in Texas did not have the floating flippers. These, by the way, are brand new flippers. They're, uh, hopefully they worked well. How they work? <coughs> um, so we brought the hardware here to prove that we can build a pinball machine. It is, it's a fully functional machine. It's got the modes. It's got the, the sample games. It's, it's got the RGB LEDs pretty much everywhere. It's got, it's got again, you can't really see these. You can see the blue lights sitting here. It's got custom RGB lit side targets. These aren't stand up targets that come through the, the play field like the targets you're used to on the other machines. These are floating targets that you can run your hand right underneath them. And the reason we did that, obviously, is because we have a monitor right here. We can't, we can't drill up through the monitor. <coughs> and our ball tracking technology can't see around the screws that are, that are in the play field. Um, target customers. So most pinball companies are targeting operators. In targeting, well, mostly they all want as many operators as they can to buy their machine. We're taking a different route. We're targeting home buyers, collectors, gamers. Really, there's two segments we're targeting. The, the, the top three are, are that segment, the home buyers. We, this, this pinball platform, we don't think is, is really something that the operators are going to want to put in an arcade. Just like the multiple video game boxes, the, uh, what are they, 50 ones or the, the main machines. That, um, they don't really work in an arcade environment. We don't think this one necessarily will either. We think it works perfect for a home environment where someone has some money to spend and they want to buy one machine and they don't want to fill up their, their game room, their living room, their kitchen, their bedroom, their, uh, their garage with pinball machines. They just want one machine, but they want to be able to play a bunch of different things. What's wrong with that? Yeah, that's the second house just for pinball. Maybe I, maybe I should stop talking. <laughs> it makes the wife happy. The other target market is the custom, the, 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 branded, the branded machines. So there are companies out there and there are individuals who want a machine specifically customized for them. And because we have the dynamic artwork, because we can do anything we want with the cabinet, we can custom build really whatever you want. We can make it look however you want. We can build custom game applications for you. Um, if, if you're you're big in a specific hobby and you want a custom pinball machine set up around that hobby, we can we can do that for you. We can do it a lot easier than going to some random or not so random custom machine builder who's going to build a machine up from scratch. Right? We have the platform here. If you like the platform, then it's pretty easy to drop in new software. The other thing about the software is it's all going to be open platform. An open platform means not necessarily the same as open source. Our framework is open source. Like I said before, you can go download the software, you can, you can use it, you can modify it, you can do whatever you want. The games we release may or may not be open source, I don't know yet. Probably for the, uh, the original things we do, they very well may be open source. Every, every other piece of software my company has written is open source, freely available, downloadable, editable. If we do a, a themed, a licensed theme, obviously it probably wouldn't be able to be open source. But the platform itself will be open, meaning anybody will be able to write their own games and run on this machine. We'll tell you how to do it. We'll give you some tools to make it easier to, to get that done. So if you have a, a programmer friend and you, you want a, a game that does something specific, then just get your programmer friend to help you out. And heck, if you want, make it available on the internet and 
try to make some money that way or something. I don't know. We're, we're, we're probably going to set up, once we, once we grow enough, and we have a few applications, we'll probably set up some online repository, kind of like an app store kind of deal, where you can just go download the new games. Hopefully people submit new games to us that we can test and then put on there. And we'll, like I said before, periodically come up with new games ourselves. So we do have pre-orders open now. We're going to sell, we're going to make 250 what we're calling special edition machines. They're the first 250 we're going to make. We're promising two complete game applications. And by complete, I mean <laughs> all the features that we advertise are going to be in there when we ship it. But it's going to, they're going to be whatever, three ball, five ball, mode based, traditional games that you're used to. Um, we want to introduce the machine with games that people can relate to, meaning we're not going to go throw the crazy features in there right away. We'll slowly introduce those a little bit more over time. You know, I mean, like I said before, once you start thinking about the possibilities of the machine, you can come up with crazy ideas that you can do. We don't have to do three five ball games. We could do, we could do multiplayer cooperative games where it tells you who to come up and play and hit the specific shot, and then it says, congratulations, now let the other player come up so he can hit the shot. You can work together. We're going to do, um, we're planning to do networked multiplayer games, head-to-head -head multiplayer games. And I've promised at the Texas show next year we're going to have two machines running head-to-head -head games. We're going to set up a little tournament and let people play head, head I have a pretty neat idea for how to use this platform so the games can connect and you can, you can battle your friends on them. And that'll work, of course, over the network, because we have a computer in there, and we can hook up the network easily. Um, a bunch of mini-games. All the mini-games we developed so far will probably be on there, but we're also talking about doing a, a few more. The one specific one I want to talk about, the last special edition only mini-game, we're going to allow you to give us media that you want to integrate into the game. <clears throat> So whether it's you want, you want your enemy as the bad guy that you shoot, or you want your family in the background, if you want your house as the, as the backdrop for, for, some of the, for some of the game, then that's cool. We'll, we'll integrate whatever artwork you want. We may make it possible to drop in your own artwork yourself. We're, we're not quite sure about that yet, but, but we will integrate your own, your own artwork into the machine. The price is a little bit more than what your Wizard of Oz is, your Stern Machines. It's a little bit less than your... John Papaduke Special Editions Machines. We feel like we're at a pretty good price point. We're giving you a, a completely different value proposition than everybody else. Right? We're, we're again, we're, we're selling a single machine, but it's, it's a bunch of different games. And like I said, we'll start with the two full games, we'll give you some mini games, and then eventually we're going we're gonna to build out our, our game repository, our database of games, and, and go from there. Um, it's a grand off if you pay early. And then we have some other staged incentives. It's, you get some coupons. If you, if you miss the November deadline and you pay by March, we give you some, some coupons for future merchandise and things like that. But um, there's more information online about that. What we haven't talked about is serviceability. And that's a big deal for, well, not just for operators, but for, for home people. Actually, it might even be more important for the homeowner because they have this machine that they don't, they don't want to have to service. But if they do have to service it, it needs to be as easy as possible. So, one is the electronics. We kind of talked about that a little bit. With all these little boards that are all over the place and over the place, though, it's really easy to debug them. Like I said, if something goes out, you know it's connected to the board right next to it. You debug that board. If you don't know how to debug that board, you pull it out, throw it away, buy a new one. You're not throwing away a $350 board. You're throwing away a $60, $70, $100 board. That's it. Or send it out, get it replaced. It's, it's a lot, obviously, cheaper to, to stock up on a couple backup boards. Keep them in your parts, in your parts closet. And, if something goes wrong, just pop a new board in. Not that I expect any of the boards to go bad. In fact, I've been selling the P Rock, like I said, for three years, the driver boards for a year. I haven't had a single customer complain about the board. That's because I only have three customers, but <laughs> we sell, we sell quite, a, quite a few boards. We have, I don't know if you know this, John Papaduke is using our boards for his machines. You've probably heard of the Predator Project. They're using our boards for their machines. We've talked to three or four other people who are thinking about starting up a boutique game design and, and using our boards. Not everyone's using our boards, but, but a good majority of the guys doing boutique games are. Mechanicals. So you see the floating slingshots. You see the floating flippers. You don't see a lot of the other interesting stuff on the screen. 
But if they break, if a flipper breaks on your old machine, you're, you're, you're unscrewing that big bolt on the bottom, pulling them out, and you have to, when you fix them, you stick them back in, you readjust them, you tighten the bolt, you, you probably break the bolt once or twice when you over tighten it or whatever. But these guys, you take out four screws, you lift the flippers off the machine, and they're completely separate. Yeah, you have a, a wiring harness or two to disconnect, but it's a totally different methodology, right? It's, it's just very different. Once you get used to it, you'll realize how much easier it is to maintain a machine. And what goes along with that is cleaning it. Wiping off the play field, my fingers go right underneath these leaf shows, underneath the, uh, the, the rails. Just again, take the four screws out, lift it up, wipe it down, it's clean. No more, what, two, three day jobs, pulling machines apart, and then trying to figure out how to put them back together after you've cleaned the machine. There's no more uh, wax build up on your star post because you were too lazy to, to, to unscrew them and pull them off the machine when you waxed your play field. We don't have any of that. Leveling. Roll. Zero. Dot to rise. Pitch. 7.7. Roll. Zero. Dot to right. I lift the play field up, it doesn't just. Pitch. 7.7. Roll. 0. 0.0. I tilt it, it Pitch. doesn't just. 7.7. Roll. One dot seven left. Pitch. And of course, it's pretty. Seven point seven. It's pretty simple, but when you're on the ground trying to level a pinball machine, what do you do? You stick a you stick a level on top of you, and you, 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 you twist the uh, you twist the feet, and you hope. Like did I should I twist it three times or four times? Let me go check. You jump back up, you're still a, a degree off, and you jump back down there again. Now you have something telling you. Not only is it telling you how to level your machine, but if I mean, one of my big pet peeves is I go to an arcade or I go to somebody's house and I, I hit the start button, I play the first ball, and the ball rolls at an angle down the play field. Holy crap, no. <laughs> first of all, the game's ruined. Now i gotta, now I got to level it if I want to play the game. We can, we can set up the software that's not allowing you to play it. If, or it, you can have a big, a big display on the screen saying you're two degrees off center or whatever. It's, it's slit, it's to the left or right. I mean, once, once you have the data, you can do anything you want with it. So our schedule is... Our first prototype was complete back in March. This is our second prototype. I'm calling it complete. It's, I mean, we pretty much were working until we hours in the morning just a couple of days ago before we hit the road. But it's basically complete. The cabinet we threw together in the last couple of weeks, I don't feel like this is the final cabinet. We're actually going to go hire mechanical engineers and build our own cabinet. Um, but I like a lot of the elements of it. If you look over there in the corner behind Brandon, actually, there's a there's a, there's a lid sitting there. That's instead of having slide out playfield glass, we built a full lid, and we have these hinges here on the machine. So you can literally just lift up the lid. You have access to the machine. You don't have. To, I don't know. It, it seems silly, but I hate pulling out that glass. I've broken a couple myself over the years, but it's just a pain to lift the lock bar up, pull the pull the glass out, do what you need to do, slide the glass back in. So you can literally lift this lid up. We pulled it off because of the because of the. You can literally lift it up, and you can lift the play field up right behind it. So there are elements of this cabinet that I really like. We'll probably keep a lot of them. A little bit of it will probably change. I don't know about a coin door. If we're selling to the home environment, probably most of you want a coin door just because that's what you're used to a pinball machine. It doesn't look like a pinball machine without a coin door. I don't know. I got one head shaking. Um, but again, we're, we're interested in your feedback and all these things. We're, we may just offer it as an option. We may sell it as a... Again, the, 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 the customize it on the website. If you want a coin door, tell us. We'll have a coin door. It's not a big deal. Because we have the serial switchboards. We actually have a switchboard right up in front of the cabinet for the, uh, the flipper buttons. So tying in the coin bags and, and things to that switchboard is just a complex wire. It's really not a big deal. I need that door. Where am I going to pull the manual? Yeah, manual. Mm -hmm. You will need a manual. It'll never break. <laughs> Online viewer. <laughs> okay. Online storage. Online storage. Online manual. On the screen. On the screen. I'll actually walk you through the uh, the service mode that I have now in a second. It's it's not it, it's mostly just test modes I built myself while I was debugging things. I made it easy myself, so I don't, I'm not going to say they're final test modes, but, but I'll walk you through those in a minute. We're taking pre-orders now. We're we're kind of combining this phase of pre-orders and development, right? We're going to go 
We're, we have a staff of three right now. We have some people on standby to go out and build production quality machines. We're, we're, we have a mechanical engineer on standby. We have software developers on standby. Um, this type of machine is a little bit different from what you're used to. We actually have to go do a lot of graphic development to make it look interesting, <coughs> and immersive, and, and, and fun. Um, so we have graphic resources lined up. We just need to make sure you guys are interested in the machine. And, and obviously, we're asking for your support as much as we can. Um, if you like it, tell us. If, if there are things about it you don't like, tell us. Nothing's set in stone, but we do have a pretty solid plan of where we want to take it and how we want to get there. This phase will lean into our pre-production, and then we're expecting to reach availability at the end of next year. And I know there's a lot of uh, talk about schedules these days. Um, we have a working prototype now. We have working software now. We have a working software framework. We have a working control system. We just have to basically make it production ready. We have to go build the real software. We have to go get everything, all of our mechanics, we've got to go get them drawn and go get them um, produced. We have contract manufacturers lined up. We're not going to try to build a factory. We're not talking about volumes that are high enough to go build our own factory. So we have con so we live in Austin, Texas, and uh, it's a, actually it's a pretty big hotbed for, for contract manufacturers. There are facilities all over the place where we can literally go give them bins of parts and instructions on how to build them, they'll build them, they'll test them, they'll ship them. So we don't have to take on all that work ourselves. And we have all that lined up. We just need to we just need to get the, the parts spec and built, the software done, and then we can take care of it. After that, we'll follow up our special editions with some kind of a standard edition. It'll look pretty much the same, probably. It'll have a few fewer features. Maybe the software will be a little bit different. It won't have that special edition game. It won't have some, some of our special edition armor. Um, hopefully, it's a little bit cheaper. But at some point, we will follow up our special editions with, with that. Multimorphic.com to pre-order. Really, all I'd ask you to do is uh, send me an email, and I get those emails, and so I get them in order, and I'll, I'll uh, go through them in order so no one jumps out of line or anything else. Get to the list. We have some available now, obviously. I brought some forms with me. We can, we can fill them out right now, um, or afterwards at the show. That's pretty much it. Let me jump into the service mode real quick before we take questions. Okay, so it's a little bit blurry, but there, there's three things right now. Tests, main settings, and main audits. The main audits is, is the, um, the tests, switches. There's a switch grid. As I run my finger through the optos up top, these are the buttons. It's just like, oh, my text isn't updating it correctly. Um, but it's just like any other little switch mode. Coils, I go. Just like any other test mode. Uh, nothing really interesting here. RGBs, I can step through and test. These are RGB flashers, by the way. I don't think any machine has done RGB flashers yet. We're using really high current LEDs for these four flash bars, which are holding in our tubes. Uh, and the cool thing about RGB LEDs, or LEDs in general, is they're not like those super bright incandescents that take a ton of current, would blow a fuse if you left them alone. So we could we literally leave this one all day. Um, but these are ultra bright ones. And some of the other LEDs that you can't see on the screen. If you look on the left side, there's one blinking. That's one of our side targets that's rotating between our red, red, and blue. Um, walls and bridges. We didn't talk about our walls and bridges. There's a feature on the machine that you can't really see on the camera again. The whole center of the play field, come up and look at it afterwards, is a row of scoops, meaning kind of like your medieval madness trolls, they pop up. But these are scoops, so they're holes. That if they pop up, the ball can fall into them. We can literally open up a channel the full width of the play field. And right in front of all those scoops is a row of walls, which are just kind of like drop targets, which all rise up and can completely block the wall. Each and every one of those features, the walls and the scoops, are RGB lit. So you have a hold of stuff. You can, it, it can change colors. You can, you can, we can use these colors to tell you 
how many times to hit it or, or, or what mode you're in in the game. Or we can turn everything red when the game's over, kind of like we did in the barnyard game. Um, but these walls, I call them bridges because the ball can roll over and we're falling, so you'll hear them pop. So now the entire middle section of the play field is, is open. If the ball goes up towards the top of the play field, it'll fall into the hole. And what we can do with games like, with, with a feature like this, is we can set up games kind of like, I don't know, like, the example I use a lot is Missile Command. The video game Missile Command, if we had missiles, missiles flying down the screen that you're shooting at, it's kind of weird if you shoot a ball up there and it hits or misses, and then it ricochets around and it blows up everything else. Well, so now we can shoot balls up, and the game can eat them, and feed them back to you. So we can feed you a continuous stream of balls, and it's kind of like a rapid fire gun game, or, or, or you just have ammunition that you're, you're shooting. The other thing, I drop all those. Now the walls are all up. With the walls being up, it's kind of like you've confined the game to the lower portion of the play field. Think of a game like, like Breakout, Arkanoid, or, or any other game where you want to do something only in here, and you don't want the balls to go up into the, into the upper section of the play field. You want to be able to fire a gun and have it ricochet around the four corners of the screen and, and take out whatever it is you're working on, or uh, trying, to, trying to blow up. And then, of course, you can lift any combination. So you, can, you can enable shots by, by raising up all the walls, lowering one, enable one shot through, the, through whichever channel you want on the screen, or you can raise up one scoop. We have a mode on here on the on the real game called black hole mode, where I lift up two of the two of the scoops, and they represent a black hole. So while you're collecting points through this mode by shooting the ramps and loops and, and all those things, if you ever shoot it in the black hole, the black hole does what black holes do: it sucks away the ball, it sucks away all your points. So everything you've collected up to that point is gone if you hit the black hole. So it's like I don't know if a, of a game that's done before. I'm sure there are some out there, but. It's setting up shots that you have to avoid instead of shots that you have to hit. So it's kind of an interesting take on things. Underkeeper. This is representing all of the stuff that's under the play field. If I hit the button, it kicks the ball out. If you watch between the flippers, you'll see a little red dot as it rolls out the drain. And now down here, there's another row of switchboards representing a trough at the bottom. And it kicks it back into the trough. So it gives you a graphical way to, to see what's going on underneath your game. If something's not working right, you can, you can pull this mode up and see what's going on. I can, you know, I can just cycle it sometimes. Um, When I'm lifting the plate up, or if I want to move the machine, I want to take out the balls, I just fire up this mode and keep the ball down so I can pull it out of the machine. Notice there's one dot right there that looks like it's off centered, but it's, um, there's another opto that knows when the ball's kicking up and over from the, from the kicker on the right. So it just tells you if that's, if that's working or not. And then, of course, the level mode, which is always active. Roll. Zero. Drive to ride. The plan is to. Um, use that accelerometer, which is doing the leveling, to uh, detect your tilts, your, your nudges. Not only that, but we can use the data to integrate nudging into the game. Think about some of the games you play on your iPhone or your, your Android phones or whatever, where you shake the game to, I don't know, to get a box to fall off of another box. Maybe we could do something like that where you nudge the machine. or It can detect when you're, when you're nudging it. It can teach you how much you can nudge it without tilting. Um, other interesting things we can do, because we have the monitor, Underneath the play field, or underneath the flippers, we can we can play video captures of like flipper post passes. We can show you exactly on the play field the ball's here. Then you flip this flipper, it hits this post, it bounces over the other one. We can teach you how to do things, and we can show you exactly on the machine when you need to hit it. Let's say we're trying to teach you how to, how to do a death save. Oh, by the way, death saves. Most of you with machines at your home, you probably like know what's death saving on. Anybody moving my machine? I'm the opposite. At my house, I encourage death saves. I um, we could use this machine to teach you how to do stuff like that, right? If the ball's if the ball's rolling down from the right, we can tell you. I mean, we could even hold the flipper up for you and tell you when to push the machine to get the ball to, to pop back up. We, 
we can help you cheat. Um, the other interesting thing about this design is I, you can't really see it, but this channel goes down to the center, and this channel goes down to the center. We don't have that offset hole that existing games do, but I think they do it for the shape of their trough. I did it this way because I wanted to be able to decimate from both sides. Yes. <laughs> what about self-playing? Self-playing. I probably ended up a mode, a demo mode, a while back that would just run through and set up shots. You probably can't. Yeah, I don't have it enabled on this demo, but um, it would run through each and every shot. It would. It would take the ball out and shoot the shots. It was about 75, 80 percent. Um, yes, of course we can do it. I would like it to be able to be self-playable, such that it's not just hitting balls that are being fed from the tube. That it's actually understanding where the ball is, how fast it's moving, maybe what kind of spin it had based on it, the path it's taking, and be able to intelligently make shots. Obviously, it's possible. We'll play again. It's possible, it's just uh, the software complexity to do that is, is, is a little bit tough. I, one of my goals is to build the ability for the machine to do a live catch. I want the machine to be able to flip the flipper as the ball's coming down and just stop the ball and have it roll down the That's one of my goals. It, 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 it's probably going to be really hard to do. But we do have all the data. The resolution we have on the screen This is a zoomed out version of the ball tracking technology we have. So each and every intersection point on the screen, actually it's not just the intersection point, wherever the ball is, it's going to be blocking three or four or five lines. So pretty much no matter where the ball is, we can take that line data and figure out the software will know where it is. So, I mean obviously if the ball's moving, we can measure the distance and the time between two points or, or whatever figure out the velocity and the direction and everything else we need to know. But again, the software to do all that and actually make it playable and intelligent, it, it, it could be a, a little bit of work. Or a whole lot of work. That's pretty much it. Let's, anybody else have questions? I kind of skipped over this question section. Go ahead. Uh, how's that anybody able to go to the Texas Pinball Festival? They had the biggest turnout they ever had down there. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many pre orders did you take and what kind of feedback did you get down there? That in March of this year, we didn't have pre-orders open. We, we, had, we opened pre-orders about three or four weeks ago. Um, the feedback we got in Texas was incredible. No one had seen the machine before. We had people at our booth the entire time. Uh, we, had, we had Jack come by, we had Steve Ritchie come by, we had George Gomez come by, and everyone, it's funny, it was funny watching the smiles on their faces. <coughs> but, but we had kids coming by the whole weekend, like I said earlier, we literally had to to have the kids step aside so other people could play the game. This, this one family of three or four kids, they, they came back every day the entire weekend. And, I want to play Bayard again. I want to play Bayard again. Silly little new games, but yeah, we had a really good turnout in Texas. If you, Saturday, said you couldn't walk through the church. The show was crowded. The show was crowded. We were, uh, we were unfortunately right next to the uh, the, the Marco Specialties booth with their big their big ACDC setup or was, was it ACDC? Yeah. With their big speakers just blowing us away. But it, it was a good show. It was a good show. Any other questions about the machine, about about the company? There must be some. Yes, go ahead. I would like to see the grid test mode with the ball actually rolling around it. That would be really cool. To how about it by, uh, how about this finger? How about this? We turn on the virtual ball. I didn't do it with my finger. It, it doesn't lag a little. Right now I'm using an averaging algorithm to figure out the ball. The, the, uh, the lines are, are they keeping up with my finger? Maybe they're lagging just a little bit. But what's interesting is we can use prediction technology because we have the speed and the direction of the ball. We can, we can predict where it's going. So we, could, we could theoretically eliminate it. Will the grid technology work for multi-ball? The grid technology does work for multi-ball. We have a two-ball multi-ball program in the game now that hopefully some of you reach when you're playing it out on the floor. Um, yes, it does. And, and, and we can do that because, again, 
because wherever the ball is, it's breaking three or four or five or six lines. So yes, there will be combinations of ball positions where you will get a little bit confused. Of course, if you have four balls on the play field and, and an asteroid that's a little bit away from your ball gets blown up, you probably won't even notice because you're concentrating on keeping the balls alive. But yes, the, the tracking does work for multiple balls. Yes? Sitting here in Austin, do you know, uh, did the Pinballs Arcade order one? Pinballs Arcade has not ordered one yet. Um, he has offered that we can take it to his place and, and set it up and let people play and set up for I've been trying to get him to like use the tournaments there. It's a really, really nice, nice place. Yeah, I think he, he's got a league set up yeah. where people are joining that. Um, yeah, like I said, he's, he's, he saw the machine in Texas and said he was ordering one and investing and he was all excited. So we'll see what happens, but yeah. Pinballs, if you don't know, is an arcade in Austin, Texas that has, it probably has 200 pinball machines in it. Ranging from just like just like out here from from really old to really new. Okay. Are the interchangeable physical modules limited to only changing the back of the play field, or can they add features down the sides as well? It's a good question. Can we set up these other playfield modules that they can extend out over the play field? Right now, the plan is not to not to allow that. We're going to have the from the uh, the scoops and walls down will be will be the platform. Um, the only thing that's not quite true is there, there are side rails that, you know, for the outer loops that keep the ball rolling in the outer loops. Those extend over, well, actually outside of the wall. But um, yeah, the upper playfield will pretty much just be the upper playfield module. But if you actually go look at games on the floor, yeah, most games have a few features in the lower portion of the playfield. But go do it. Do, do, do it as a little exercise. Walk around the floor and see how many games, how many late 80s, 90s, 2000 games have stuff in the middle of the playfield. It's really not that much. This thing looks completely open because it is, because of that monitor. It's kind of an optical illusion. It's really not any more open than, than most pinball machines. I mean, a little bit, but, but not crazy. Yeah. How about uh, uh, some of the replacement parts? I mean, you talked a little about serviceability. Um, plastic tubes you have for the ball turns and stuff like that. Um, I know it's more designed for home use, but you know, like I, I'd be a little bit worried about like maybe discoloration or warping, and you know if I need to replace those versus yeah. just, you know. Let's brands. talk about the tubes. The tubes. I like the tubes. I did the tubes originally because they were an easy way. Well, I thought they were going to be an easy way for me to create a ball path without soldering up wire forms and bending on it or, or, or doing some vacuum form to ramp. Um, I don't think the tubes are manufacturable. We've talked to some manufacturing people about how to build these tubes, and it's probably not going to We're probably going to wind up with traditional wire forms and then vacuum form ball channels. Um, so in that sense, it'll be just what you're used to. Interestingly, I talked to Brian Eddy about some of the play field, and he said they considered doing acrylic tubes for, I think it was the shadow, because there's some element in the, 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 the movie that I don't know the movie, um, related to the tubes, and he said they rule them out for manufacturing reasons and because they're hard to clean. And it was actually funny because a few weeks earlier we had pretty much ruled them out for production because they're hard to manufacture and they're hard to clean. Um, but really, all I all I wanted was a smooth transition out of the ball kicker, the, the vertical up kicker, and I wanted to deliver the ball down here, and we can do that with other means. So, as far as that stuff goes, it, it's we're going to design those out. Everything else. Um, Mostly it's a combination of acrylic and Lexan. Pretty much everything else is built out of Lexan. And I don't think Lexan is colored for okay. Not only that, but Lexan is like 200 times stronger than black. So there's at least the Lexan elements, which is what the flippers are, are made out of. And the, uh, well, actually, these flippers are acrylic. They're going to be made out of Lexan. The, the, the top plastics are all made out of Lexan. And there's pretty much no chance of any of that breaking. Some of the acrylic elements could possibly break, but we'll probably replace all that with like same tape. You just tap your software. I'm sorry? Do you apply for patent? We have 10 patents pending on this machine. Software patents, hardware patents. Yeah. So you, how far away do you have them completed? So we've done provisionals, so we have to follow up the real ones and it takes however long, but, but we are protected on, on all of our key features. We're protected. At least we think we're protected. If someone filed a provisional a week before us, then then we think we are and we're not. But, but yeah, we have all of our main technology covered. 
Anything else? In the back? Could you speak on the uh, firmware and software updates? Firmware and software updates, yes. This will be, I mean, the firmware, the, the firmware, when I think of firmware, I think of the hardware, how, how we have the hardware set up. And that is updatable, upgradable now through a tool, a software tool that we distribute. The software itself will have, like I said before, we'll probably have an app store thing, like thing for downloading new games. And then we'll probably set up a server where you can go in and, and the machine will call into it and, and get its software updates automatically. I mean, we have a computer in there. We might as well take advantage of all the tools and technologies that other people have built for doing this stuff. It just doesn't make sense to, to make it difficult on anyone. It doesn't make sense to have you update via a USB stick if, if you have a network connected. Of course, if you don't have a network connected, then, then USB or, or whatever media is the only real option. But yeah, we'll make it as easy as we can. I mean, we're technology guys. We want it to be state of the art. We want it to be just as easy as any of the other equipment that's out there now. No pinball equipment, but, but no technology. Anything else? Yes. On the, on the software, do you have a software simulator for an SDK? So obviously, you know, it's great to have one if I wanted to you know, write my own game or whatever, but if I don't have the platform in front of me, is there something I can use to, you know, so is the, is the question, do we have an emulation of the play field, the, play the ball field. tracking, yeah. all that stuff? Maybe not the ball track, but you know, at least enough to, to, to get something going without actually having hardware. Right, so not yet, but yes, we will. Our software guys will, will develop that for their own use, right. and, and then we'll make it develop for it. We're, we're planning on distributing an SDK once we get to that point, a software development kit with, with the tools and the, and the uh, emulation functions and features required to, to build software. Yes. I think we have probably time for one more question. So. Who wants it? Yes. Are the components on the boards are they surface mount? It's a combination. Um, the driver boards, all the transistors are through hole, but pretty much everything else on the board is surface mount. When I read about the discussions on the forums about surface mount and through hole, I don't know, I kind of chuckle a little bit because a lot of people think that through hole is easier to service. And that may be true for certain technologies, but in general, if, if you get comfortable enough to, to replace through whole things with a solder, soldering iron, it's actually easier if you learn the right techniques to replace the surface mount. So I don't feel bad about those decisions. But again, my transistors for all the driver boards are, are through hole, so you can clip them in on solder and the pins will fall out, drop a new one in. Yeah, very easy. And then, like I said before, if you don't want to do that work yourself, again, it's, a, it's an 80, 90, 100 dollar board that you're replacing or, or whatever. So send it out to get it replaced and grab a new one and stick it in there. I mean, transistors can fail in any number of ways. They may be short, they may be open, but no, the game doesn't currently detect. But these are all things that over time, as we mature as a company and as our platform matures, we'll, we'll build in features and make it easier to debug and make the system smarter. Obviously, we have a system that we can, we can expand in ways that all our systems couldn't be expanded because they're all embedded. But we have access to the the tools, technologies, to we can take advantage of a lot of work done by other people in the software world to, to make this platform a lot a lot easier to use, serviceable and extensible. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Give us your feedback. Thank you.